Gospel grace to you and peace be multiplied through Jesus Christ our Lord. I first registered to vote, I think it was, I was in my early to mid-teens, or I'm sorry, early to mid-twenties. When I registered to vote, I voted in several American political presidential elections. During that time, I pastored a church, and my desire was to be a good Christian, a good pastor, and a good American. I was paid part-time for the pastoring work that I did, and so that gave me a bit of free time in between my part-time other job to read the newspaper and to listen to talk radio. Even from my late teens, I would often listen to Rush Limbaugh particularly. I found him very insightful and entertaining with, quote, half his brain tied behind his back just to make it fair for everybody else. I also listened to Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity at times trying to stay up on all the latest. And every election became the election to end all elections. Uh, the year was 2012. The face-off, the showdown, was between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. And I remember the election day came, and I went to the polls, and I cast my vote. For the right person, of course. Won't tell you who that was. And it really didn't take much time in the physical scheme of things, maybe 10 minutes. The polling place is very close to where I lived, and so it wasn't a big investment. Just a small matter. I remember feeling good that day. Uh, Mitt Romney was up in the polls. It looked like he was going to win by a landslide. Perhaps I've given away my vote there. Uh, later in the message, I'd like to share with you what transpired in the following 24 hours and how that shaped my views of political engagement. The title of the message this morning is, We Don't Vote, Go to War, or Do Politics. What do we do? In my way of thinking, the we, we don't do this, we don't do that, and what do we do, is specifically targeting or talking about we as Anabaptists or Kingdom Christian people. We who have tried to live a careful conservative, and that doesn't mean politically, but that means by uh, certain standards, certain guidelines, certain brotherhood agreements. <clears throat> We've tried to be a careful, living Christian people who submit to Jesus' reign in a very literal and purposeful way. I think the title also relates to how we, as conservative Anabaptists, as Kingdom Christians, have chosen not to be, by and large, involved in political or international matters. Now, there are several qualifiers, and you may have some questions already bubbling up in your mind, and that's great. This is not the message to end all messages. This is the beginning of continued discussion and conversation. <clears throat> The first qualifier I would like to offer is we need to acknowledge that there have, as far as I understand, almost always been a small percentage of Anabaptists who have voted in national political elections. That would include some Amish, some Brethren, some Hutterites, and perhaps some Mennonites. Probably the best known group nationally of the Anabaptists, of course, is the Amish. They're also the largest, running about 330,000 in number at this time. Somehow, in my mind, I got the impression that the number of Amish who are voting has actually been on the increase. And so I talked to my friend Edselberg, who is an Amish researcher there at Elizabethtown College, and he said that actually is not the case. Amish involvement in politics, as best can be tracked, peaked out somewhere during George Bush's second term and has continued to decline since then. But it's possible that as many as 5% in some communities, Amish communities, do vote. It's possible. 
most Amish communities, most Anabaptist groups, that number will be precisely 0%. And that's the group that we largely, I believe, represent uh, today. And that's where I'm, I'm coming from. Secondly, I'd like to offer the qualifier that we're talking about national politics. We're talking about being involved in the kingdom of this world. Governing the local church is also a political endeavor, since political simply means to govern how we operate, how we make decisions, how we accomplish things. So politics is not a bad word. Political is not a bad thing. We engage in these things in our families and in our church families. And of course, many of our churches do use a voting system as part of their governance. So this is not a diatribe against voting. It's about political, national involvement. And the third qualifier is that this message is both descriptive and prescriptive. In other words, when it's descriptive, I'm describing what we generally do as Anabaptist people. But I'd also like to include a few prescriptive things I think we could amp up and do more of. My main thrust this morning is this. Rejecting political activity frees us for kingdom productivity. Rejecting political activity frees us for kingdom productivity. To bolster this claim, I'd like us to consider three angles. The first, I believe, that we need to consider is to consider our margins. Consider our margins. Definitionally, margin is the edge defining inclusion in or exclusion from a set or group, the boundary line or the area immediately inside the boundary. Here's the reality, brothers and sisters. While there are many nations, there are only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of darkness, and there's the kingdom of light. There's the kingdom of death, and there's the kingdom of life. There's the kingdom of the evil one, and there is the kingdom of God. And to that end, we can only have primary citizenship in one of those two kingdoms. We must choose. As you recall, Jesus was constantly talking about the kingdom in his ministry on earth. In fact, one of the last things that he told his disciples before his arrest and crucifixion, as documented in Luke 22, 29, is he said, I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my Father bestowed one upon me. And then after his resurrection, Luke reveals in the book of Acts that Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples talking and speaking with them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So what happens when a person chooses to turn from Satan to Jesus? In Colossians 1.13, Paul states that when we have repented, God has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his, the Son of His love. There's not a single person on this earth that, spiritually speaking, has dual citizenship. You are one or a citizen of the other. Those who are members of the devil's kingdom cannot be members of God's kingdom at the very same time, and vice versa. Furthermore, you recall that Paul notes in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So how should such a truth impact those of us who have sought to embrace this reality? There are two kingdoms. I can only be a citizen of one at a time. I am choosing the kingdom of God. How does that impact me? The way it impacts me is it turns me into a stranger and a pilgrim.
We read this in Peter's plea in his first epistle. He says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. A stranger is somebody who doesn't quite belong. It changes our orientation toward those around us. I don't know how it is for you, but I'm sure you've had the same experience. You're in a restaurant somewhere. Maybe you're shopping at Walmart. And my apologies if you don't like Walmart, but it is a cheap place to get things. And uh, for a family of seven, it's a handy place to go. It's all in one place. Maybe you're simply walking through town, but you have this sense that something's not quite right. Getting gas at the gas station. This feeling that, I feel like an oddball here. Has anybody ever had that experience? I think a few of you have, yeah. (laughs) Congratulations. That means, likely, that the stranger status is working on you. It means, likely, that your citizenship really is in the kingdom of God. And that's a good place to be, though it doesn't necessarily feel like a good place to be. It identifies that margin or that boundary the Holy Spirit has put within you that keeps you from entirely identifying with that world system. So the stranger status has to do with my orientation toward others, particularly those who are in the kingdom of darkness. My pilgrim status has to do with my orientation toward the future. A refugee is somebody who is fleeing and oriented toward the past. We're not refugees. We are pilgrims. We are oriented toward the future. We are going toward something. We are going somewhere. And that's what changing kingdoms does. It works within us that stranger and pilgrim status, which is a very healthy thing indeed. The reason that something as innocuous or as small as voting is so dangerous is because it blurs the boundaries between those two kingdoms. It tends to cause things to get a little fuzzy. And it's easy to begin asking ourselves, am I a Christian American or am I an American Christian? And there's a world of difference. In fact, there's a kingdom of difference between those two designations. They sound similar, but they are very different indeed. Ignoring the margins and boundaries in one generation easily leads to ignorance of margins and boundaries in the next. Political posturing and dabbling will not help our offspring gain a kingdom of God vision. And that's what I'm imploring you to consider today. I'm not here to change your mind if you are a voter. I'm not here to hit you over the head. I'm here to ask you to consider everything in light of eternity, in light of the kingdom of Christ. This is not about building walls for the sake of purity. Rather, it is about maintaining margins for the sake of clarity and reality. Nobody is helped, least of all those who are in the kingdom of Satan, when believers blur the lines between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. It's time to retrace our boundaries. It's time to refresh our margins. Once I believe we are clear on the two kingdoms, we are then free to provide the help that the world needs. Secondly, I'm calling us to consider our mindset. When you think about national politics and political leaders, I'd be curious what your gut reaction is. When I say President Biden, Donald Trump, Vice President Harris, whatever comes to your mind with those words, those names, gives an indication of what your mindset toward politics is, and toward the political system. 
Now, to be honest, politics and political thinking is everywhere. <laughs> we, we really can't hardly escape it, especially during an election season, which feels less and less like a season and more and more like an American way of life. But it's out there. And so it's impossible almost to not have some thoughts, some feelings about national politics. I think there are a number of reasons why we tend to be drawn into the system. And yes, this can happen to good Anabaptists and good Kingdom Christians. Let's be aware of it. There's curiosity. What's going on here? What's going to happen? Who will, um, you know, get ahead in the polls? How will this dogfight turn out? The choice of leaders does impact our lives. It does have a, a bearing on what happens across the nation. There's the element of competition. You know, some people just like a good game. Maybe particularly men, but I know there's some of you women out there that are very competitive. You know who you are. Just say Dutch Blitz. Uh, <laughs> there's that element of competition in politics. It's very fascinating. There's the element of comfort. We want to keep our comfortable lives. We have it very easy here, unprecedentedly easy in America. And voting feels a lot more tangible and easy than other things that we could or should do. There's the element of control. God has designed every one of us to rule. We are designed to govern. He gave Adam dominion. That's within us. And so to see others who are striving for that mastery, there's something within us that... Uh, that can connect with that. We have been given the mandate to exercise order, to develop and maintain that. And then there's the issue of concern, uh, fear, worry. What's going to happen if so-and-so gets in or so-and-so doesn't? Anxious about what's going to happen if the right thing doesn't take place. So I'm not condemning curiosity uh, about local and national things. But there is a difference between getting caught up on the news and getting caught up in the news. Huge difference. The risk is that too much listening, too much watching can become a form of armchair political activity. It really can. And all of a sudden we're calling shots from the sideline when it's not even our game. But I have heard the statement that Anabaptists by and large are non-voting Republicans. Ouch. <laughs> Are we getting a little too involved? Getting in too deep leads to a bigger danger, which is political activity leads to political captivity. In the opening, I referenced how I had registered to vote. I have voted in several presidential election cycles the year was 2012, it was the election again to end all elections, and Mitt Romney was up in the polls on election day. What transpired soon after that, many of you have the history as well, you were around at that time, was a shocking turn of events in which Barack Obama seemed to come from behind at the last moment and took the election by storm. He won the presidential election. The part that I had played had felt small, it felt like I didn't really have much skin in the game, it didn't really matter so much, but when I woke up and found out the results, <laughs> I was shocked. I was sad. I had big emotions. And as the day progressed, I tuned into my hero, Rush Limbaugh, to see what sort of consolation he could offer. And I have to tell you, Rush ain't got nothing. He had nothing, nothing to share, nothing to say. During that time, I had been uh, listening to messages by John D. Martin on the kingdom. I had been listening to messages by Dave Rousseau on what early Christians believed and how they lived. And through those various inputs, and through this experience in 2012, I count that as a turning point in my life in relation to political national uh, involvement. 
Never again have I exercised any uh, voting right or power. Or, I have no interest. Because I came to realize some very valuable lessons from that disappointing day. One of the most surprising lessons I learned is how subtly a little choice like voting, and again, in this grand scheme of life, it's very small, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. A small choice like that can hijack one's emotions and take them into political captivity. And so I cannot give you chapter and verse to say that voting is wrong, and I'm not here to de-Christianize anybody that votes. But what I am saying is that kingdom living and national voting cannot be completely reconciled. They do not entirely fit together. Worse, they are very, it's very possible that engaging in that leads us down a path of much greater political involvement and captivity. The inconsistency happens and cannot be reconciled because you cannot completely consummate the relationship that you're engaging in by voting. In other words, you're putting somebody into office and giving them the power to use force, but as a good Anabaptist or Kingdom Christian, you're saying, but I can't exercise force myself and I can't support you. I can't sign up for your military. I can't uh, enter into the Marines. So you go do your thing. I'll put you in, but I cannot help you out. It is completely inconsistent. So to vote or not vote is not explicitly a Bible issue, but it is a wisdom issue. The more we engage in national political involvement, the more likely we are to be drawn in emotionally, unwittingly, to the issues of the day without realizing how immersed we become. I think as parents, we realize this. Parents of teenage children, 20-something children, we are... I don't have children that age, but you know my goal is, as they grow up, I'm going to be encouraging them, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Don't give it away. Don't let it go. Emotionally, protect yourself for the one that God has for you. We understand that in the relational context. Can we understand it in a political context? I am here as your father today asking you, if you are voting or you're considering registering to vote, please hear my plea Guard your heart. I'm asking you to abstain, to refrain from political, national involvement because of what dangers it represents. I have good relationships with people who are very scared people. Uh, they're scared of conspiracies. They're scared of the economy crashing. They're scared of who's going to get into office. They're scared of how the election will go. They're scared of being manipulated by people. Why? It's because they're imbibing this stuff. <laughs> Turn off the radio. Stop watching that stuff on your phone. You know, we took a strong stand against TV years ago, and I still take that stand. But somehow when it shows up in our pockets, it's okay. I tell you what, it has just as influential and more so. Guard your heart. We are kingdom citizens, and anything that makes us more citizens and patriots than it does strangers and pilgrims is not good for us. Furthermore, as defenseless Christians, which is the moniker for us as Anabaptists, defenseless Christians, national voting is a means of using force to get our way. It might not seem like a huge force, but it is a means of force. And again, that is inconsistent with who we are and who we have called, been called to be. We are called to be, of course, salt and light. And I'm not denigrating those who are part of the kingdom of the world, but we could look at those who are part of the kingdom of the world as flesh, and those who are part of the kingdom of God as salt. And the answer for the needs of flesh or meat is not more flesh and meat, it's salt. It's salt. And so the clearer we draw these margins and the more clear we are in our mindset, the better we can help those who are in the kingdom of darkness. 
And so before we become too smug about the fact that we have never voted or we've stopped voting, we do need to take personal inventory and ask ourselves, just how wrapped up am I in election 2024? If certain polls go up, do my emotions go up? If certain polls go down, do my emotions go down? If somebody is almost assassinated, do I feel despair? The beautiful thing, brothers and sisters, is that rejecting political activity frees us from political captivity. Rejecting political activity frees us from emotional receptivity. And of course, the main point I'm trying to drive home is that rejecting political activity frees us for kingdom productivity. While it's true that we are not of this world, so, so true. It is equally true, I hope it is, it better be, that we are for this world. We are for people. We care about people. The same God who said, love not the world, is also revealed as the God who so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's the kind of people we're called to be. We are for the world. We are for the nation. Every nation that has an inbreaking of the nation of God should be better off. And that includes the nation of America. As we look around at our neighbors, at our friends, and yes, at the leaders of the nation, we should be asking ourselves, how can we help? How can we uh, work for the good of the nation. I'm encouraging us to consider our mindset toward authority. Are we respectful? When we talk to the policeman, do we say, sir? When we're called in for jury selection and we need to refuse, do we say, your honor? Do we speak respectfully of those who are in leadership? Are we respectful toward those around us? Are we building respect? in what we say. The point is, there are bad ideas out there. There are bad policies. There are things that we should disagree with. There are wicked things. The call for us is not to respect all ideas. The call for us is to respect all people. And so you can believe entirely differently from me. You can be a Hindu or a Muslim, a New Ager, or a nun, no religion, but I still respect you as a person. You have value. You are made in the image of God. We've examined our margins and our mindset. This brings us to the third and final angle where I'm asking us to consider our methods. As kingdom people, we have a propensity for action. We want to do things. We're a practical people. That's great. We like to see results. It's important for us to evaluate what we're doing to see if it's lining up with the desired end. Because means and ends in the kingdom of God must match together. There's a saying that the end justifies the means. Not true for us. Not true. Means and ends must go together. And as a defenseless people, we use defenseless means to accomplish kingdom ends. In the kingdom of God, the way something is done is as important as the why that something is done. So what is the best thing for Anabaptists to do? We don't go to war, we don't do politics, and we don't fight. And yet, like every other human being, we want to exercise control. We want to affect change. And this is the beauty of it, brothers and sisters. The kingdom options that are open to us are brilliant, beautiful, and accessible. In other words, anybody can do these things and affect change. You don't have to register. You don't have to have a certain level of education. All it takes is commitment. The main thing we're called to do is seeking. Seeking. It's right there in the Kingdom Constitution, the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone can do this. Seeking first the Kingdom of God and His righteousness and when we do that, everyone benefits, including those in the kingdom of darkness. 
What does it mean to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness? I like what Bruce Waltke says. He was talking about the righteousness of Noah and Abraham. He said, righteousness connotes behavior that serves the community according to God's norms and establishes the well-being of the community. He goes on to state that the righteous are those who are willing to disadvantage themselves to advantage others. This is my concern, brothers and sisters. My concern is that the world out there looking at us sees us not voting, not fighting in the military, and they look, us, look at us as those who are simply enjoying the benefits of a free society without committing ourselves in any way. It's another option to gain another farm, to make my house more palatial, to build my business bigger, to have a better life. An American dream that is supposedly the Anabaptist dream, but a very thin veneer of the American version. We are not here to accrue benefits and blessings for ourselves. We are not here to build up a big pile. We are here to give. We are blessed to be a blessing so that in turn we can be blessed. It's a cyclical thing that God has designed. And so we don't engage in those things not so we can run off and do all sorts of amazing, wonderful, selfish things, but so that we can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which is about serving the community through which we are making our pilgrimage. The nation in which we are strangers, whatever nation that is. Seeking first God's kingdom doesn't end, and seeking, of course, it continues on in serving. Jesus said the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. They're called friends of the people. That's what all the politicians say. Yeah, I'm a friend of the little, little man. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger and he who governs as he who serves. If we are known as anything, we shouldn't be known as people who do, you know, raise lots of money at relief sales and, and have huge farms and tremendous businesses. We should be known as strangers and pilgrims who serve. That's how we should be known in the world. Strangers and pilgrims who serve. Yes, we can avoid political involvement. But it's possible to take all that extra time, all that extra money, all that extra focus, and simply squander it on ourselves. That is neither Christ-like nor scriptural. We are called to serve leaders by thanking God for them, by praying for them. Paul says in Timothy, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We serve leaders in three ways, by praying, paying taxes, and obey. By a show of hands, I'm just curious about this. I'm not here to cause any problems. How many of you, within the last 24 hours, have prayed for the leaders of the American nation? Okay, we have maybe 4%, 5%. This is a command given to us in Scripture. This is an opportunity that we have to effect change. It was sometime, I think it was in Barack Obama's second term, I already sort of gave away how I voted, but I also tried to follow the scriptural injunction to pray for leaders, whoever the leaders are, to pray for them. And so I was praying for President Obama. And one night I had this dream. I'm not big in dreams and experiential, you know, ooshy gooshy things. But this dream did have an impact on me. When I had a dream that I met President Obama. And most of us have probably thought about this. What would I do if I met the President of the United States? And what if he happened to be a president with whom I differed in opinion on things? Now keep in mind, I've been praying for President Obama out of duty, because I'm told to, but in my dream, I don't recall that I even talked to President Obama. 
I simply looked at him and he looked at me and suddenly I felt the weight of the nation that he must carry coming down on my shoulders. And I had a very different feeling about President Obama. Did we still differ profoundly in policy ideas and ways that things should happen? Absolutely. What I'm saying is, if something little like voting can change us, something little like praying can also change us. In a good way. In a powerful way. And this is something I continue to practice to the day, to this day. When Donald Trump was president, I prayed for him and for the vice president and on down to President Biden and Vice President Harris today. We are called to be serving, serving our neighbors, caring about them. I think it's important for them to know that we, we do care. We're not just isolating ourselves, saying, well, not my nation. Well, it's not our primary nation, but we are affected. And we do care about people who are hurt by wicked and bad policies. We do care about disasters that happen. We do try to help, seeking the good of our neighbor and our communities. And especially for you young people, I'm encouraging you to serve ahead. Develop a track record of service now. And to that end, Christian Aid Ministries, CAM, has put together what they call the CASP, CASP program, C-A-S-P, which stands for Conservative Anabaptist Service Program. It's designed as an alternative to military service. We've not had a national draft for decades. Most, many of us have no history of that. Um, but it very well could be that there would be, again, a military draft where every young man would be forced to register. This is taking a preemptive strike, so to speak, and saying, let's encourage our young men now to serve the community through forestry projects, helping with disasters, with relief, and showing the selective service and the American government, this is what our young men want to do. They want to help in ways that don't take life. They want to help in ways that serve the nation. And I really think that we, we should encourage every young man to take time to serve as a, either in CASP or take a year or two in voluntary service. It is going to serve you, young man, tremendously. It's going to serve your companion, your wife, tremendously. And this just isn't for you young men. You young ladies need to think about building a track record of service as well. It's very possible that women will at some point be drafted into military as well. It's common in nations around the world. There's a bill in Congress right now for that, and there have been multiple bills. I have no idea if it'll go through or not, but that constant pressure is there. What better time than now in a time of peace to establish a track record of service? And I would also encourage you, everyone, how many of you read Pilgrims and Politics by Michael S. Martin? Oh, good. The harvest is ripe. I think it's about 2%. I'm assuming that Andrew St. Marie has this on his book table. This book has been so influential in my life. I read it after I stopped being involved nationally politically. But Michael Martin in Pilgrims and Politics lays out very clearly God's purpose for nations, political involvement, and our respect toward those leaders. Excellent book. I highly recommend it. And then I'm encouraging us to serve subversively. Now, when we talk about subversiveness, we think about overthrowing the government. What I'm talking about is taking things that the devil means for evil and turning them for good. I'm talking about taking things that seem small and God multiplies them for huge benefit and kingdom advance. The genius of kingdom methods, I'm particularly talking now about giving alms. I think Anabaptists are pretty good at that. Praying and fasting. Now, these three are all mentioned in the kingdom constitution, Matthew 6. I'm, I'll be curious to know which one we as Anabaptists do more poorly at. Is it the fasting or is it the praying? Because my sense is we could amp it up on both fronts. My sense is that Satan is coming to us and he's saying, here, uh, let me take that nuclear bomb and I'll give you this BB gun. Basically, that's what it's like. When you trade 
praying, fasting, and giving for voting. What's that? What are we going to accomplish? Satan knows the power of the weapons that we have. <laughs> if I were Satan, I'd do that trade. I'd say, hey, come here. I, I got something for you. Pretty BB gun. Look at this thing. I'll take that ugly nuclear uh, bomb there. Uh, you don't need that thing. The power of united, praying, fasting, seeking God, not for a certain outcome, but for a good outcome, for a kingdom outcome, that, I believe, is where we would see amazing kingdom advance. And the, the, the beautiful thing about kingdom methods is how they exercise control and effect change without feeling coercive or violating free will. <laughs> we can engage this nuclear bomb of prayer and fasting without people in the kingdom of darkness feeling like we're strong-arming them. When in reality... We've got the greatest authority and power in the world, and we are using it. <laughs> Do you see what we're missing, potentially? And to that end, I'm inviting you, in the month of October, to take every Wednesday or whatever Wednesday suits you to fast from lunchtime, whatever that means for you, if it means eating bread or not eating anything or drinking juice, to fast for the needs of this nation. We need to get some skin in the game. We need to show people that we care about this nation through which we are making our pilgrimage. And they may never know about it, that's okay. But we need to get serious about the power that we hold in our hands. The reason we're not being more productive is because we are not engaging the kingdom weapons that we have been given. There's a verse in Psalm 33.10 that I've really come to appreciate. It says, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples to no effect. I, I love this because this is something that you can pray no matter who you are or where you are. Pray that God would bring to nothing the counsel of the ungodly and that his kingdom would prevail. And to that end, I want us to engage in a brief exercise at the end here of this message. I'd like you to stand. Those who can, maybe not everybody can stand. We are going to pray together and exercise this nuclear bomb. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe, maybe nothing. We can't see all that goes on in the heavenlies. But we can practice, and that's what this is partly about. I want you to practice so that when you go home, you continue to incorporate this in your life. I will say a phrase, and you repeat, repeat it. Dear God, thank you for the leaders of this nation. Thank you for the peace that we have had. Help the leaders to recognize their need of you. We pray for President Biden. Vice President, Harris, Vice President Harris, the Supreme Court Justices, the, Supreme Court Justices, the Representatives and Senators, the, and senators, the, governors, the governors, the County Commissioners, the county commissioners and, the and the Township Supervisors. O oh God, bring to nothing the counsel of the ungodly. Help truth, to Help truth to prevail. Help the plans of the wicked one to fail. The the one to fail. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus name, amen. Man, you may be seated. You could have prayed that with just a little more conviction, but it's a start. <laughs> we have the potential, the opportunity to be an army of good, not forcing people, but calling on the one who has all authority and who will effect the greatest change. Rejecting political activity frees us for kingdom productivity. Mm -hmm.